Hi, and great to be with you today on the Skin in the Game uh, conference. Uh, first of all, uh, happy to be here. This is my second uh, time that I'm cooperating with your organizers. They always bring great audience and they always bring great speakers and some phenomenal ideas are exchanged. Sorry that you're just seeing my ugly face on this big screen. I wish I would be with you and let's try to make this thing as interactive as possible. Throughout the, the presentation, you will see a little Twitter handles and hashtags and we'll be in touch via Twitter. Uh, uh, and I'll try to respond to some of your questions because I think the interaction is the most important part of each presentation. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Serge Popovic, uh, calling in from Belgrade, Serbia. Used to be activist in the times of the Serbian dictator Slobodan Milosevic back there in the 90s. Uh, got infected with the idea that the people, small people like us, can make movements to do the social change, and then spent most of my career building this type of movements across the globe through my organization named Center for Applied Nonviolent Action and Strategies. Today, we are going to talk a little bit about this phenomenon, and we see movements happening everywhere, and we see protests throughout the world in the times of COVID. We see uh, protests against the COVID measures. We are also witnessing probably the world's largest wave of protests against the systemic racism which really warms my heart. But, you know, nonviolent movements and social change are so much more than just protest and marching on the streets. So today I'm going to show you a few tricks and try to guide you through the toolbox because making a movement is not so much different than making a startup. And I assume most of you are most familiar with startups than with the social movement. So how you start small, how you come out with your idea, how you take a look at the market and which tools you need to get to this series A, series B investment and how we get more people and how you build this into the brand. All of these topics are very relevant when you talk about the startups and business, but they're also very well connected with the topic I'm going to elaborate today, which is how to build the movement in 10 easy steps. So laid back, take a look at the screen, and let's walk through this art of movement building in the next half hour or so. First of all, we need to understand that the what the social movements are and what they are about and how they're different from what you see in a TV when we are talking about the protests. The movements are living things, they are organization, and there is a connection between the two. What you see when you see protest is what we typically call the mobilization, but very important part is putting this mobilization in use and turning it into the organization. And this is where we are looking at several steps that you may want to imply if you take a look at the social change, or if you are passionate about fixing something in your neighborhood, if you're passionate about the climate change, if you're passionate about your environment, also if you're passionate about the politics and injustice, these are all very interesting tools that you can apply. So let's assume that the movement can be built. And like these little American books, let's try to walk through this on the level of dummies. I don't assume you guys are dummies, but I was a dummy for so many different stuff. And what we figure out throughout the canvas work is making it simple, is really making it really effective. So first of, first of all, you need to look at the battlefield. One of the very important thing is to figure out not only what is the social change that you are fighting for, what is this thing this movement stands for, but also what is the environment. And social change is very much related to another great book you want to read. It's called Art of War, and it's written by a Chinese strategist several thousand years ago. And Sun Tzu in this book said once, know yourself, know your opponent, and know the terrain, and you will know the outcome of the thousand battles. So instead of just looking in us and looking in them, you want to look at the terrain, the social terrain. So where is this topic dropping in the terms of terrain, and let's take a look at some of the topics that are nowadays very present. Let's take a look at 
environment, for example, and climate change. So who are the leading activists on fighting the climate change? Who may be your active allies? Taking a look at the organizations, taking a look at the Green Party, taking a look at the green businesses, who may be benefiting from more active climate change politics? And then you want to take a look at your opponents. So who, so who says this is a Chinese hoax? Where is the oil industry? Where is the, where is the coal industry? Where are all these opponents of, of your topic and the social change towards this topic. But most important, who are the people in the middle? And how do you mobilize this silent majority? Because whatever the change is, and whenever you're looking at the different constituencies, the large number of the people actually drops in the middle of this social spectrum we normally teach as a uh, uh, spectrum of allies. Majority of people are either not interested, they're not informed enough, they don't care, they think this is somebody else's problem. Well, finding the way to talk to these people, finding the way to figure out what it would take for them to get involved in a process and finding the way to recruit and train them is actually the key to the victory. So what you are looking at is not making your allies more active is not disabling your opponents, but actually mobilizing the group of the people that we called the middle ground or neutrals. So how do we find these neutrals, how they are segmented, and why would they care for our topic is the first thing that we need to do when we are building this toolbox. Step number two, know what you want. Uh, you know, the Social change is a journey from place A to place B. Place A being a status quo on certain topic, place B being where we want to be. First, we need to decide where we want to be. This also impacts the process of uh, a nonviolent struggle very much because in building this vision, you're actually talking to the constituencies you want to mobilize, you're talking to your allies, and you're trying to find the smallest common denominator. So what is this list of things that people can agree upon uh, as the list of things that people can't agree upon. And once again, how do you build towards the neutrals? And this also answers the question about your organization's mission, about the things you'll put in your website, about your talking points. But these are the product of the, of the process in which you really need to find your vision and really need to understand that you need to build a unity around this vision. And unity doesn't mean only the unity of like-minded people. Unity also means that you need to talk to the people you disagree on certain topics. And you want to make, want to take a look at the women's rights questions, which is also a very hot topic in the world. And recently, four years ago, we witnessed the largest world mobilization in America around the day of President Trump's inauguration. So probably the single largest number of people being on the street in one day in the history of US. But it wasn't followed up with the organization because there was no clear vision. So yes, we would all like women to be equal as a man, but what are these topics in this struggle which can cause unity? where this is the equal salary for equal work, where this is something else. You want to take a look at a set of the very concrete goals and then unite the organizations and groups around these goals. You also want to look at the topics that divide people. So when you talk about, the, uh, uh, for example, gender equality and you're looking at the United States, there is this pro-life, pro-abortion thing which is very divisive and somehow creates the identity. So you have groups that are standing for women's rights that are very much uh, uh, pro-choice or pro-abortion, but they're also very much for some other things like equal salary for equal work. And you have a groups of uh, very loud uh, conservative women in U.S. that are supporting strongly the idea that women should be CEOs or they should be paid as men or they should be the half of the Congress and the half of the Senate. But when it comes to the issue of abortion, this becomes very divisive. So how do you build the smallest common denominator based on the facts that you agree upon and how you agree what are the topics that you disagree and you don't make them the problem at the beginning because that will slow the movement's growth. A uh, long story short, you want to look at the things that connect people and the things that people can agree upon, and you should build your movement's vision around this topic, agreeing to disagree about other topics later. Step three is how we are going to get there. Uh, 
There are three principles of successful movement. The first one being vision and unity. The second one being planning. The third one being nonviolent discipline. And when you see the protest on the TV, normally people think uh, that this is a one-time standing event. And very often you have dramatic events, the events that change the landscape of the country or the world. And very often you see the TV anchor saying, oh, well, a spontaneous uprising. You had millions of people on the street. Nobody expected this. Well, let me tell you the truth. There are only two types of social movements in this world. They are either spontaneous or successful. They can't be both. Successful movements need meticulous planning, and that planning should be from planning your general strategy, looking at the pillars and the institutions you want to shift towards the social change, building the campaigns towards individual pillars and institutions that you have been targeting, producing these campaigns, and then what you see on the TV is just the tactics. So protests and marches and petitions, all this stuff, this is very on a tactical level. But once again, to quote Sun Tzu, uh, strategy without tactics is just the wishful thinking, and tactics without strategy is just noise before the defeat. You want to look at the boat. You want to look at the strategic planning and you want to look at the tactical planning. And yes, that reminds you on the business. You want to look at the market. You want to look at the business plan. You want to look at the sales plan. You want to look at the pockets of consumers that you want to target. This is very similar, but here we are talking about the mobilizing people and not the money revenue. And what you really want to keep in mind at all times is that you need to break this journey into the small portions. Movements are, are the thing that are related to emotions. The people will follow the emotions. The people will move towards goals when they're passionate, but they need milestones and they need things to refer to and they need pieces of legislation that are brought and they need small victories on this uh, journey and you need to mark these small victories and make them the part of your plan if you want to run or help a successful social movement. Uh, step number four is uh, you need to know what the targeting is. And very much like in a, in a sales market, you want to see that uh, it's not about the advertising and the messages, but it's about understanding the people that you're actually messaging and understanding these groups. And now we're witnessing uh, uh, movements that are di discovering this over and over. And it's really interesting how the groups not learn anything from their own history. I'll give you the, the example of targeting uh, uh, talking about the Black Lives Matter and this racial injustice struggle that we are witnessing now. When you listen to this movement now, compared to when you were listening it to, to the time of the civil rights movement and the Martin Luther King back there in 60s and 70s, you see them talking mostly about the two things. One is police brutality and defunding the police and finding the way to cutter this, this uh, police. And of course, justice for those people impacted by the police brutality. And then another one is symbols and, you know, fighting the symbols of colonialism and taking the statues out of the park that are celebrating the, the racist past and things of that kind. Well, I mean, this is very good tactical targeting, but it doesn't ta target the real groups that can be the game changers. So everybody who read uh, uh, more than one page on, on racial equality knows Rosa Parks and have heard of the Montgomery bus boycott. Montgomery bus boycott was a large campaign organized by civil rights movement. And of course, the romantic story is that the brave uh, Afro-American woman in a segregated bus refused to stand when the white person came in. And then immediately all the Afro-Americans and bunch of, of, of clever whites start boycotting transport system. Well, sounds like a nice story, but but this is not how the things were going on. There was a strategy behind this. And every time you see a successful campaign, you ask yourself, why Montgomery and why buses? So why not New York or, or Paris and taxis? Uh, because this is where the Afro-Americans had leverage. They were the majority of the people using public transportation. The rich white people had cars. They, Montgomery was exactly the city, Montgomery, Alabama, where you have the very tough mayor and very tough governor who were refusing even to talk about desegregating buses. They tried everything. They tried petitions, they tried protests, they tried picketing, and they figured out that they need to change the target. So instead of targeting these legislative institutions that were behind the segregational laws, 
places like mayor's office, places like governor's office, the, the civil rights campaign decided to target businesses that were funding the elected, uh, the elected white officials, the businesses that were segregated, the schools, the public transportations, and they pick the public transportation because this is where they can have the most impact. So if they boycott buses because the buses are segregated, the bus companies will lose money. If the bus companies lose money, they'll be put in front of the dilemma where to keep up with segregation and keep up losing money and then get going out of the business or go to talk to the mayors and governors and say, we need to change the segregation laws because we are losing money and we are going out of business and there won't be anybody to fund your campaign. So this is what the effective targeting is. Deciding about whom you are targeting and why you are targeting exactly that institution. And eventually, of course, the businesses talk to mayors and buses were desegregated. Very recent example of this also happened in US with a, with a movement to control guns. Every time there was this, uh, there is a shooting in the school, somebody gets killed, the people go on street, and then the politicians take it over. And then the left side says, we need more gun control. We need background checks. The Republican side says, no, no, this is our human rights to carry guns. We need to arm teachers and professors to make school more safe. And then the thing dies in media after the few weeks until the next school shooting. Well, when the school shooting happened last year in Parkland, Florida, the high school kids were more clever than that. They learned a big lesson from a civil rights movement, the lesson of targeting. So instead of going just to the senators and politicians and President Trump, which they did, they were looking at a place where they really had leverage. And this place is stores. So they went into Walmart store and say, we are going like every single teenager in Florida is going to boycott Walmart, it's going to boycott Amazon, it's going to boycott the exporting goods if you keep selling weapons with no background check. So we don't care what the laws are. We can't change the laws. Politicians don't care about us because the legal age of voting in that country is 18, is 21, and they're younger than 21, so they don't count in the voting calculations. But they do buy on Amazon and they spend big money in Walmart. So these businesses step aside and say, okay, how many weapons we sell? How much revenue will we lose if we put the background check on the weapons? And in comparison to it, how much money we are going to lose if we get boycotted by hundreds of thousands of teenagers across the country? And eventually they decided to put the background checks on their counters. So this small victory was achieved because you put your strong point, your buying power, into your opponent's weak point, which is their selling power, and because the targeting was clever. If you mobilize millions of people to march in front of the city halls, the politicians eventually will decide based on their tribal thinking and tribal expectations. But if you take a look at a different pillar like business, there will be a more rational calculation, and this involves your strength in potentially boycotting these businesses. So step number four, after knowing your battlefield, developing your vision, and looking at the strategy and planning part is which institutions you want to affect. Do you really want your racial struggle to be about removing uh, the statues from the park, or you want to make sure the companies are paying people of color equally as they are paying the white people? That would be a tremendous victory. And this is where you could put the power of this movement into use, and this is where you can take a lot of the people out of the poverty, and this is where you can create the opportunities for many of the people of color across the globe, but it's a matter of targeting. So the more you look in these movements, the more you understand where they target properly or not. Step number five, the power is in numbers. Uh, what you really need for social change, and there are many scientific studies, you need everywhere between three and 5% of the population affected being active for change. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but it's actually a lot, especially if you're talking about the national level. People power movements are all about the people. So most of your activity is getting more people and getting the best out of these people. Why are people so important part of the movements? First of all, 
they give you authority. The more people you have, the better chances are that somebody will listen. Second, the people are source of ideas. The people are source of skills. The people are source of talent. And for good quality movement, you need many, many different talents. It's not enough to wear badges and, and yell slogans on the street. Somebody needs to know how to fundraise. Somebody needs to know the arts of public speaking. Somebody needs to design leaflets to look nicely. Somebody needs to build a website. If you want a successful movement in 21st century, we need the people with skills in social media. So more people you recruit, the better are chances that you're going to get the skills into your movement. People are also the single individual source of the new people because the people who like movement, the people who participate in the movement tend to spread these ideas and then they can recruit their friends and family and neighbors. And this give access uh, from your ideas to the people that you can't easily access. So the main lesson for successful movement is you need to recruit people, you need to invest into people's training, investing into people's skills is the single best investment when it comes to the nonviolent movements. And then very soon you need to get people active because if people are recruited and are just the, the passive members, they tend to leave. The difference between the movement and the structured organizations like NGOs and political parties is that movements move. This is why they are called movements. And in order to move movements, you need to figure out the small things that people can get engaged so they contribute. The trick is you recruit a person, you bring a person to the meeting, and then next week there is a few pens that the person needs to spread. There are like the few, few, uh, uh, few posters they need to put, few stickers, a petition offer for them to sign, something little to make them feel useful, to make them feel that this movement really, really is something that it is about the people, not about the leadership. The more ownership you give to the people in the movement, the more they're likely to carry on movement, the more they're likely to come with, a, with their own fresh ideas, and the more they're likely to carry on throughout the exhausting struggle. And that struggles, you know, they, they can last for years. These are not the political campaigns which end with the election days. We are still fighting for gay rights worldwide. We are still writing for for racial rights worldwide. We are still writing for female rights. Uh, uh, there are places where, where, where women are not even allowed to drive. So this may be the marathon. But in order to expect people to participate in the marathon, you need to give them a little something. Decision-making power, the importance. And the more you leverage the people's importance, the more is your movement likely to survive and thrive throughout the challenging times. Step number six, understand that violence can kill your movement. If you have hundreds of thousands of people demonstrating in the streets of Hong Kong, and then you have the bunch of radicals trying to throw stones and get a clash in the police, guess how the cover pages will look tomorrow. Violence captures media attention, violence sends the wrong message, violence justifies any repression against, against the protesters. We've seen this with Yellow Vests, in, in France, and violence tends to bring numbers down because if the movement's activities look like a cheerful, protestable type of thing, so you're building the human chain, then I would come and bring two of my young kids on it. If there are chance for a tear gas and stones flying around, I may be coming, but I'm not bringing two of my young kids. And eventually, if I think the live rounds will be shot and somebody will get dead, there are little chance that I will be there on that spot because I have responsibility for my family. Nonviolent discipline is a skill. This is not something related to nations and cultures and whoever tries to persuade you into this, uh, this is crap. You can learn this like you can learn to drive the car or the bicycle or to ski. First, you need to preach nonviolent discipline. You need to make everybody in the movement sure that this is what the movement stands for and then condemn the individual acts of violence. Second, you need to take the tactics that are less likely to produce violence. If you do human chain, if you do boycotts, if you do phone calls, if you do petitions, if you do hitting pots and pans from the windows, all of these tactics we call the tactics of dispersion, and there is no physical contact between your troops and the police force and your troops or your opponent troops, the violence is less likely to occur. Also, if you need to do the mass tactic of concentration, you talk 
to the police. You talk to your opponent. You try to de-escalate this moment of contact, where this is by organizing your own safety people on the ground, where this is by sitting when you see the police ranks, where this is by putting monks in the front lines, a tactic very often used in Asia. They, they often invite the Buddhist monks to be in the first row because police wouldn't attack the Buddhist monks because of the, of the customs. And then the Buddhist monks are less likely to attack the police than the, than the soccer fans, for example. So you can take a look at it from a ideological or preaching level. You can take a look at it on a tactical level. You also want to go back to the step number one and take a look at the battlefield. Are there radical groups that are supporting your goals but they are not supporting your commitment to nonviolence. Take a look at every single protest when you have a G G20 summit. You have hundreds of thousands of peaceful people uh, protesting for climate, uh, against the corporations, for, for jobs equality, and all of this kind of stuff. And then you have the radical groups like Black Bloc coming there, starting fight with the police, breaking windows, trying to get in the spotlight. So you need to know how to disfranchise your movement from potentially violent groups because wherever there are cameras, they may come in and then, then their message becomes your message in the media if you are not careful. There are tips and tricks how to deal with this. This is a skill. Many movements in history have learned how to do it. And we have books and videos and all this kind of stuff on our website talking about this. Once again, this is a place to remind you to take a look at the, at the Twitter handle and uh, take a look at the hashtag and ask your questions and post your comments. I would be super happy to respond to them. Step number seven, uh, build your identity and build your brand. Uh, movements are very much, the difference between movements and, 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 and single campaigns or protests is that movements do have identity. They have goals, they have values that people share, they have behavior that people share as well. You probably care about the environment. You are now in the big event. Are you throwing garbage everywhere? No, you are not. You are keeping it in your file, the trash can. If there is a trash can where you can separate the recyclable garbage from, uh, from uh, the other type of garbage, will you separate it? You probably would. So would I. So this is our identity. You care for planet, I care for planet. We do the same things without even thinking. So you want to build not only the set of values, but the kind of behavioral pattern within your movement. And very often it's easily done through symbols. The photos you see are from, from Serbian movement called Otpor. A uh, very well-designed symbol was the clenched fist. It symbolizes the unity in the struggle against the, the Serbian dictator. These symbols help not only for people to identify yourself uh, and, and for physical branding and showing power, these symbols help for people to recognize that they are not alone. The fact that you're having something on you and I'm having something on you helps recognize that you are not alone. It also helps spread the message. It also helps uh, the idea that everybody is the leader and the era of social media, it's, it, this branding sh share, increases shares and views and this kind of stuff. So when you are thinking about building the movement, you start with a small core group, you examine the battlefield, you come to the ideas, you cut it to the smallest common denominator, you start planning, you decide about the targeting, and then you go one way back and say, how do we look to the people? So when the others see us, how do we look? Do we look organized? Do we look passionate? Do we look threatening? We don't want to look threatening because this will repel people off. So these are some tips and tricks that you have about the point number seven, which is how you build identity. And then creativity. Creativity really, really helps. And when you take a look at the creativity, probably the two largest field in the world is social movements and technology. So as much as creativity helps in the technology, as much the creativity helps with building a nonviolent movements. And here are some examples why something simple as trying to persuade your city government to fix the potholes can be such a source of creativity. First example is from Russia, 2015. You see the pothole and you see the face of the mayor and his promise that these potholes would be fixed by October, but it's May next year already and they haven't been fixed. So the groups in, 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 in Yekaterinburg, which is the third largest uh, Russian cities, engage the street artists to paint the face of the mayor 
around the pothole. So when you hit the pothole with a car, you have a person to curse. It becomes kind of personal. And of course, uh, uh, authoritarian and not very clever as they may be, the local government came in, they cleaned the graffiti, but didn't fix the potholes. So that created another layer of anger and amusement for the people. Uh, from Russia to Panama, uh, Panama City is one of the fastest developing cities in the Central America, but they don't cope with their infrastructure. So the streets are full of these crutters. They, they engage the, the, the advertising agency, which would use the small objects, which you see on the, on the slide, that look as a hockey pack. So these objects tweet. This is their nature. So what happens is when you hit the car, which has this little object in it, this little hockey pack, it tweets straight to the mayor account. So, hi, I'm the pothole number 32 on the corner of streets X and Epsilon, and I just heard the car of this lovely old woman. Fix me, fix me, fix me. With a simple strategy and putting these objects into less than 100 potholes, Panama activists produced more than 25,000 tweets in first week. The potholes were fixed. So this is one success. And maybe if you don't have technology and you don't have Twitter and you don't have money, you may take a look at the guy on the last on the last uh, uh, on the last uh, uh, slide. And that's the guy from Zim, Zimbabwe, a very poor country in in sub-Saharan Africa. Its second largest city called Bulawayo. This amazing group of Bulawayan activists that are planting trees in the potholes. So A, that serves as the reminder that the potholes are that big and unresolved that they can host the whole tree. And then B, it helps you with not hitting the pothole because as your driver, you will see the tree. These potholes were also partly fixed. So when you take a look at the, how different cultures and groups on different level of, of social freedom and different level of money access and different level of technology are treating just one simple thing like potholes, you get the idea how important is creativity in building your social movement. From creativity to humor, uh, yes, changing society is serious business, but yes, you may want to be as unserious as possible. We spent years, and recently the book came out, Pranksters versus Autocrats, which you can buy like from the Amazon. We were looking at the 40 cases of people using humor in chasing nonviolent struggle and perceiving social change. For putting the face of the Serbian dictator on a petrol barrel in Serbia back there in 999, and then inviting people to hit it with a bat, and then having the line of the people doing this, and then creating this large dilemma for the police, what they will do. Because you're doing nothing illegal, you're hitting the barrel, so they can't arrest you. They can't find who the heck organized this, so they can arrest us who organized this, and they ended up arresting the barrel in front of the TV camera, so that ended up being on the cover page of the newspapers. And from there all the way to Siberia, uh, where after the, the elections, uh, the fraud elections in 2012, mm -hmm. people were not allowed to protest, but they brought the toys and they made the toy protests, and then they made the local police ban the toy protest because the videos from the toy protest went viral. And you just type in the toy protest in Google and there is a little movie you can watch. It's amazing on Guardian, I think. And uh, what you are figuring out there is that uh, the role of humor is threefold. It breaks a fear and apathy uh, within the society. It helps your movement or group look cool. And people love to thrive around the cool things in every segment of life. But most important, if you challenge people in power with a prank, a lot of these people have a very distorted vision of themselves and they take themselves too seriously. So even the most powerful guy in the world when it comes to controlling its media and the police, Vladimir Putin, the guy who poses shirtless and love wrestling tigers and saving dolphins from drowning and diving for amphoras. And he would react and ban the toy protests and therefore show that he's afraid of toys. So... These dilemma actions are putting your opponent between the rock and the hard place. So if they ignore it, people will know that they can get away with it and they will keep it doing it, so they will appear weak. If they react to it, they will appear stupid. 
So this is a lose-lose scenario that we're talking about, and there is a growing impact of this type of creative, humorous actions in nonviolent struggle. Last but not the least important, finish what you start. So many amazing protests we had in Arab Spring 10 years ago, still only several countries made some kind of democratic advance. The others are back in autocracies or worse, like Libya turned into civil wars. Actually, there are three phases in the life of every social movement. The first one is fun, you emerge, you recruit numbers, then you engage and grow numbers. And then there is a place we call the victory point. This is where movement have a chances to win. And then whether by making a strategic mistakes, whether by not planning for the transition, whether by losing steam and numbers, these movements fail. So the science teaches us that the most vulnerable part of the movement is not when you start, but when you're on the brink of the victory. So how do you turn this victory into the real institutional change? And what are the pitfalls that are waiting for you is something that we are passionately exploring and teaching people about, first of all, you need to understand that you're vulnerable in that stage. And then second, you need to, to plan after this stage. So it's not just protesting so we bring down the coal plant. We need to find a way to figure out how to prevent coal plants being built in large cities so our kids are not burning, uh, are not breathing dust. So whatever struggle you pick, you need to make sure that it has a follow-up and it ends up the proper way. At the end, uh, here is the book for you that you can buy in France. I don't have a clue how to pronounce it. Its title, its original title is Blueprint for Revolution. Uh, it's a story of how we were dealing with 35 different groups from different countries throughout the history, but it's also a story of courage and creativity and commitment for many of these groups. Once again, if you want the successful movements, what, what you can do, yes, you can build it. And then, and then what happened and how we can help this movement by identifying the core group, building skills, help strategic and tactical planning, boosting this engine of recruitment and training, be there for them in the moments of despair, and at the end, make sure that the job is done. Uh, without further notice, I would say that uh, this may not be something that is that you're doing the, the, dealing with in, in, in your life, but it creates news and it creates change. And if you're ever in the position to start a social movement or help a social movement, remember that there is a very handy toolbox on how to do this effectively. Once again, take a look at the Twitter handle and hashtag down there. I would be happy to answer your questions. I don't know if we are going to manage to see you live. That may or may not happen depending on the technology, but I'm following your questions on Twitter and I will be responding and hopefully you will see it on the Twitter feed. With that notions from Sergei Popovich and Canvas, I give you the big hug. I wish you a great evening and great food for your thoughts in making the world the better place. Thank you for a chance for speaking with you and thank you for your patience.